was a kid, I, um, I think I memorized the entire Guinness Book of World Records, the 1987 edition. And, uh, and you might think I'm kidding, but you could open up any page and you could say uh, what the category was and I could tell you what it was. I love the facts of the 1987 Guinness Book of World Records, big thick book. And so this past week, I had the opportunity uh, to look at some other um, world records. And so you might not find it interesting, but just pretend for a second, okay? Uh, David Rush, Boise, Idaho. He balanced an object on his head. We don't know what the object is. It couldn't have been a hat, right? It, it couldn't have been a hat. It was some object, but he's got the world record. Um, two hours, 36 minutes and six seconds. Two hours, 36 minutes and six, six seconds. He balanced something on his head. Christian Rodriguez of Spain he balanced a ladder on his chin for 17 minutes and 14 seconds. Okay, yeah, some of you think you could beat that? I got a ladder right here. You want to come up and we'll try it out for a sermon illustration? No. Um, and these are unbelievable world records that nobody cares about. But, uh, but I, I thought it was cool because they have a whole category of world records that have to do with balancing. The ability to balance something on your head, to balance something on your chin, to stand uh, uh, and balance uh, different weights and all of these different categories. And I thought, what a great illustration uh, for life. Life uh, throws so many different things on top of us, whether it's our kids, our, our work, or our um, uh, lack of wealth, or our surplus of wealth, or whether we should buy a Powerball ticket or not. How many of you did that? Okay, nobody wants to say, hey, I'm not legalist about it, okay, but it, nobody won. And so now it's up to $1.9 billion. And if you want to waste your money, it's up to you. But if you win, just make sure to tithe on that, okay? Just make sure. <laughs> so um, all these things in life. And, and the person that's the successful person, the person that is the godly person, the person who um, would be one uh, that... Ecclesiastes would say, knows that there's more than just life under the sun. This person would have the ability to take all of these different things in balance and to still stand. Life can throw all these things at us, but the joyful person, the person that knows God will be able to stand in spite of it. Now, there's a lot of people that have their life, it looks like they have it all together. And they look, like, they look like they would be the ones that would stand, and, and they look good, and they, um, they have the right clothes on, clothing on, but when the storm hits, it reveals uh, if the person actually has the truth to be able to stand. Today we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we're going to be in the second half of uh, chapter 7, verses 15, through, Lord willing, the end of the passage, verse 29. And I want to give you some general... Um, truths, some truths from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and uh, we're going to start here in verse 15. If you got your Bibles and you're open to Ecclesiastes 7 verse 15, you there? If you're there, say go. Okay. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that, and from that, withhold not your hand, for the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man, more than ten rulers who are in the city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does, does good and never sin. Here's the first point. There are general truths, um, but they're not necessarily specific promises, okay? General truths exist, but they're not specific promises. He starts out with this hevel situation. Remember, hevel is the word for the smoke or a vapor or meaninglessness or vanity. Here's the hevel situation. Did you see it? A righteous man dies in his righteousness. A wicked man lives and he prospers in his wickedness. This is Hevel. 
This is hard to take. And, um, well, why is that? Well, we hear about somebody dying. Uh, if you're like me, you'll ask, well, what did they die of? Okay, so let's just take, for example, some guy died. He's um, 78 years old. And, uh, oh, so-and-so died. He did? What did he die of? He, he died of lung cancer. Lung cancer. Oh, man. Did he smoke? Yeah, for 45 years. Oh, okay. Okay. How, how about um, um, so-and-so, Susie? Uh, what happened to her? Oh, she died. She was 53. What'd she die of? Uh, lung cancer. Did she smoke? No. Oh, man. I guess it just can happen to anybody. And so we hear these different things, and some of them don't make sense to us. And so I jotted down these things, see if you agree. The way things should work is if you smoke, you will probably get a disease and die younger than if you didn't. If you steal, you will go to jail. If you exercise and eat right, you will live a long life. If you do what is right and you don't cut corners, you will get ahead. These are general truths. And generally, they are true. But not all the time. But not all the time. Um, let me show you from Proverbs chapter 28 a, a couple more examples of these. I think you understand what I'm saying. But let me just show you. Just flip back a couple pages. Proverbs 28. I'll show you two of them. Verse 10. Proverbs 28 says, Whoever misleads the upright into an evil way will fall into his own pit, but the blameless will have a goodly inheritance. If you mislead somebody, you're going to fall in your own pit. Generally true, but sometimes there's people who mislead people for their whole life, and it never catches up to them. This is Hevel. There's sometimes uh, when people who are blameless that they will have a goodly inheritance. They'll be smart with their money. They'll be smart with their wages. They'll be... But there's sometimes when a blameless man will die young and penniless. Look at verse 18 of chapter 28. Whoever walks in integrity will be delivered, but he who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. Generally true. Generally true. But what Solomon is saying here in chapter 7 verse 15 and following is that there is something in life that there are no guarantees and so then he goes on to say something very strange that you would never probably guess that would be in your bible okay did you notice that verse 16 be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise be not overly righteous whoa what is he saying don't be too godly don't, don't get in the God thing too much. Is that what he's saying? No, no, no. He's not saying that because then he's going to go on and he's going to say, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. And so he's going to say these two different things. Um, don't think that by your righteousness, don't think that by your goodness, you're going to um, excel, that you're going to live a long life, that you're going to prosper because it doesn't always work out that way. But he says, but neither be this fool that doesn't care about anything because generally speaking, if you're a fool, you might die before your time. So we're encouraged here uh, to not think, okay, that what you do, whether you're righteous or whether you're wicked, it necessarily guarantees what will come, what will come. Here's the application, first application point. You've heard of let go and let God. This is let go and fear God. Let go and fear God. You see it, verse 18? It is good that you should take hold of this, not withhold your hand. From what? What should I take hold of? For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. So he's saying, don't be overly righteous. Don't think that your righteousness is going to demand a certain outcome from God and, and don't be overly wicked either but fear God that's the point fear God because the one who fears God is the one who is truly wise the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom he's going to talk about the fear of the Lord again in chapter 8 he's going to talk about it extended extensively at the end of the book we'll talk about it more but fear God fear God 
General truths are not specific promises. We need, need to remember this. Number two, don't give people the power of definition. He talks about wisdom, verse 19. He talks about nobody's righteous, everybody's a sinner, and that runs into verse 21. Look 21. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. I love this. I love this. Don't give people the power of definition, meaning uh, don't worry about what other people are saying about you. Don't let them define who you are or what you should do. Don't let the people that are picking on you define your life. Don't let them tell you who to be or what to do. People say bad things. People do mean things. And this is particularly evident in uh, grade school, in high school. Now, it's not that just people get mature and they're so nice and wonderful to one another. People are mean to each other when they get to be adults, too. But it's, it's, it's more concentrated, it's more visible when it's in school because we have all of these little rotten sinners together in one building. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and I was there, and I was one of them, and people say and do mean things. Now, when I was a kid, I got made fun of. I got made fun of. Uh, because of my giant head, okay? And uh, it's not, it doesn't look that bad now because I've gotten fatter and bigger as the years gone on, but when I was actually in shape, I looked like I had a bowling ball on the top of my head, okay? And I just had to gain this weight just so I look uh, normal. And, uh, <laughs> and people made fun of me for my head, okay? They called, I don't, why am I even bringing this up? I cried many nights over this, but they uh, called me uh, Lumberhead instead of Lombardo. Lumberhead, see? Okay. Don't ever say that, please. But you know what? Not only do people say bad things, mean things, we shouldn't listen to them. You say bad things. You say mean things. That's what the text says right there. He says, uh, don't listen to the person that might be cursing you, but your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. So yeah, you've probably been the victim, and it stinks to be the victim. It does. You've been bullied, been picked on, and that's not good. Don't listen to what the bully says. Don't listen to the lumble, lumberhead statement. Um, but just remember this. You're not without fault either. We've picked on people. I've picked on people. Since I've grown in my walk with God, I've had to go back to people from my high school days and apologize to them. Because I remember the words that I said and the things that I did, the way that I acted toward them that was not Christ-like whatsoever. Don't allow your life to be influenced by people's opinion. And don't feel like you need to express your opinion to them. Here's the second application. Why do you care about what people think? Why do you care about what people think? Here's a question. What does God think? What does God think? Fear God. That's the underlying point of all of Ecclesiastes. It's here in chapter 7. Fear God. That's the question. What does God think? I jotted down two things, two areas of your life. Jot these down. What does God think about my attitude, number one, and my actions? What does he think about the way that I'm thinking about things? What does he think about what I'm doing then with my life. Philippians chapter 2, Apostle Paul speaks about this. First he says to have the same attitude of, as Christ. He says have the same mind as Jesus Christ, and he, Christ who gave of himself for us. And then he says, chapter 2 verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation in which you shine as lights in the world. We are part of a twi twisted and crooked generation. And don't be grumbling, don't be fighting, don't be disputing. Be lights. Have the good attitude to go out and make a difference. Shining the light of Christ in dark places. What an attitude to have. Then he goes on. He says, hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in faith and labor in vain. Hold fast to the word of God. Ask 
yourself, not what do people think of me, but what does God think of me? What does God think about my attitude and what does he think about my actions? Are they lining up with the word of God? That's what you're doing right now. You're coming and I, I'm thankful that you're here to come under the word of God along with me as we read this and apply it together. Okay, last point. Wisdom is good, uh, but it's not personal. Wisdom is good, but it's not personal. And here's what I think he's saying. Verse 23, all this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? First, wisdom is elusive. Wisdom is a very elusive thing. And, and remember, wisdom is not just knowledge. It's the ability to take the knowledge that you have and to put it into practice. He says, I, I looked for it, but it was far off and it was very deep. And who can find this? And um, in the same way, people who come uh, to truth, to the truth of Christ, they have the ability to um, either just receive it as knowledge or to apply it as wisdom in their life. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus called these two different ways, the, the wide road that, that leads to destruction and the narrow road. Few people find it. And we're all on the road of life somewhere. But there's only a few people who see Christ, receive, receive Christ, and then apply his life to theirs. These are the few that find the way of life. There are so many people, maybe who call themselves Christians, who know Christ but they don't live it. Wisdom is elusive. Then he goes on, verse 25, I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and who, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Now, what's going on here? Does Solomon just hate women? No. In Proverbs chapter 7, we have the personification of wisdom. Wisdom uh, looks like a, a woman, a righteous woman. Um, here, we have the opposite, I believe, of wisdom. It is folly and foolishness. And this is personified as this woman who is a, a prostitute. Now, the point isn't lust, although that can be part of it. The, the point is that um, in this pursuit of what is true and what is good, we can be distracted and we can go toward what is folly and what is bad and what is evil. And that is just like this woman who's a prostitute and who's tempting and saying, come with me. And when you go... Her heart is uh, snares and nets and hands are fetters. You're going to be chained by the evil, by the darkness of this anti-wisdom personification here. And then he goes on. He says, um, this is so dark and hard that not anybody can actually find the truth. And here's where the despair gets real bad. Verse 27. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things. I'm adding things up, seeing how things work out. Verse 28, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So he says this pursuit of wisdom is so elusive, it's so hard, that he says only a one in a thousand men find it and no women find it. Now, you're like, man, he really must not like women. So a couple different things could happen here. Number one, it could be that he's just saying it's so rare that one out of a thousand men can find this wisdom and not get ensnared by the world um, and no women do it. And that would wouldn't be anything contrary to the times of his life. 3,000 years ago, women and men weren't having conversations with one another unless they were married, okay? And so um, he's not gonna be having these debates with women. Women didn't have the same status as men in his society, it was just reality. But I don't think that's what's happening here, okay? Here's what I think he's saying. 
He's saying, and he's speaking of himself, one man among a thousand I've found. He's the one man. He's the one man who has wisdom. And so he's basically saying, there's not any men and any women that can find the truth of this wisdom. That's what, he's, that's what I believe he's saying. He's the one in a thousand. There's no men, there's no women. This is how difficult it is to find this truth, this wisdom. Our day and age is filled with these same people that, that, that um, maybe think that they're finding wisdom, but they're not. Remember, wisdom is knowledge and applied to their life. In our postmodern day, um, there isn't any truth with a capital T. There's the truth for you. There's the truth for me. I can be whatever I want to be. I could be a woman. I could be a squirrel. It doesn't matter. Um, my truth. And so, um, you know, don't tell me that there is the truth. Just as long as you're true to yourself, that's what's important. Be true to yourself. And no. Truth, wisdom is good, but it's not subjective. It's not personal. Now, what wisdom applied to your life, it's a personal thing. I'm not saying that, but it's not subjective. There's not just different truths out there, and you just got to make sure you're just honest with yourself. There's a truth that everyone must consider, and it is the truth of God. It's the truth of His Son. In Matthew chapter 7, I ended up spending a lot of time there this week for some reason, because... Uh, I looked at the broad way and the narrow way, and I just kept reading in the chapter, and I just felt like it, it it's goes along well with this, uh, this wisdom, this righteousness. And we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says in, uh, later on in chapter 7, he, he starts talking about people who, it seems like they know the truth. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that means there's some people, and maybe in this room I pray not, but there's some people that have a knowledge, they know about Jesus, and, uh, and yet their heart is far from God. And so there's some people that say, Lord, Lord, and, and on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? these people they even did some good things they did some things to be seen you notice all three of those things that they did were outward things that they participated in that showed their allegiance to there are people who know about Christ there are people that are in the body of Christ there are people that gather with the family of God together but are there some then that Jesus says and then I will declare to them I never knew you Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is a challenge that we would see uh, the truth of Christ and we would apply it to our life by wisdom. Not only just believe it, but live it. But live it. He goes on. Jesus tells us, Example then about someone who hears his words and does them. So he believes he has faith and he does them. Not with perfection, but his life is different. Her life is different because of Christ. This person who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. When we are building our life on the wisdom and the truth of Christ, then when um, the hevel comes, then when the things come that shouldn't come, our house, our life, will stand. With the fear of the Lord as your foundation, build your life on Christ. Faith in Him, a life that's lived for Him, 
And when heaven comes, you'll be able to stand.